I'm Jim McDuffie, President and CEO of Bonefish Tarpon Trust. Our mission is to conserve bonefish tarpon and permit the fish, their habitats, and all the connections that they form to create the larger fishery. We do this over a, a large region stretching from the Bahamas and Florida Keys in the east to Belize and Mexico in the west. And throughout all of that region and all of our work, you see a science-based approach and collaboration, two things that were part of our DNA as an organization from the very beginning. In collaboration, we work closely with anglers, guides, lodges, industry leaders, scientists from other leading institutions across the country and around the world. When BTT started 20 years ago, we didn't know what we didn't know. This fishery was in decline. Local anglers were seeing that in the bonefish population. But because there had been no conservation organization or governmental agency tracking it over time, we didn't know the causes of that decline or how it could be reversed. So we invested considerable time and effort in science, building baselines on the fishery that didn't exist previously. And then over time, as knowledge accrued, we were able to apply that in meaningful ways to conservation action. And today I'm delighted to share with you the words and thoughts of our researchers from Bonefish Tarpon Trust. I'm Lucas Griffin, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust Research Associate. I work on tarpon research here in the Keys and across the southeast U.S. Today I'll be talking about best practices for tarpon catch and release. The first lesson is, for tarpon greater than 40 inch fork length, do not remove them from the water ever. This causes too much damage and stress and decreases their chances of survival. If you must handle a fish, only use clean wet hands. It's important to minimize the time you handle the fish next to the boat before release. All right, she's got it. For tarpon less than 40 inches fork length, if you hold a smaller fish out of the water, support it beneath the head and belly and minimize exposure to air. If you want a photo, get the shot set up before removing the fish from the water. A good rule of thumb is, if the fish is not dripping water in the photo, it's been out of the water way too long. Never use mechanical lip gripping devices, since this can cause jaw injury. Keep fingers away from the gills, as damaged gills make it hard for the fish to breathe. And for all tarpon, keep them wet. And if a fish can't swim upright on its own, revive it until it can. And reduce the fight time on future fish. If you wish to find the tarpon's weight, measure the length and girth, and use the BTT tarpon weight calculator. This is free to use on BTT's website. When reviving a fish, be sure the water passes over the gills, from front to back. Move the tarpon forward or hold it upright in the water, allowing it to pump water through its gills. Hi, my name is Justin Lewis and I'm the Bahamas Initiative Manager for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Today I'm going to talk to you about best handling practices for bonefish. It's very important to crimp your barbs on your hooks prior to going out that minimizes handling time once you have a bonefish next to the boat. And then also we recommend you don't use anything less than 12 pound test tippet. This allows you to put pressure on the fish and get that fish in as fast as possible. When handling the bonefish, it's very important to keep that fish in the water for as long as possible. If you are going to handle a fish, it's very important that you use clean, wet hands. If you do have sun gloves on, it's very important that you take them off. They're abrasive and they can remove scales and slime from the, from the bonefish skin, which is protective layering. I know a lot of people like to use lip gripping devices. For bonefish, it's very important that you do not do that because research has shown that if you do use lip gripping devices on bonefish, 60% of the time you're going to damage the bonefish's jaw, which can inhibit them from feeding once you've released them. Whether it's your first bonefish, your biggest bonefish, or any bonefish in between, whenever you're out on a trip, everybody wants to take a picture of the fish that they've caught. So it's very important to have that fish in the water, get your cameraman ready. Once that cameraman is ready, you lift that fish out of the water. Once that picture is taken, you put that fish right back down in the water. It's very important to minimize air exposure. It shouldn't be more than 15 seconds that you have a bonefish out of the water because that will negatively impact its survival post-release. When handling the bonefish, it's very important not to grab the fish by the gills because your fingers touching the gills can cause them to rupture and then that extra air exposure will also cause them to fuse together, which can negatively impact their survival once you release them. I'm Lucas Griffin, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust Research Associate. I work down here in Florida and across the southeast U.S. on the tarpon research projects. Today I'm going to be talking about the ethical fishing practices. 
One of the most important aspects of fishing is to match the tackle to the fish and the conditions of that day. Here are some techniques to help you land fish quickly and effectively, and to avoid overexhaustion and leaving them vulnerable to predation events. For example, when I'm fly fishing for tarpon, I'm going to use no heavier than 20 pound class tippet. This allows me to land the fish quickly, and also if a shark approaches, I'm going to be able to break that fish off rather easily. For bonefish, use no lighter than 12 pound tippet. And also I'm going to only use barbless hooks to quick and easy removal of the hook. One additional aspect is to always apply maximum pressure on the fish. You can almost always pull harder than you think. Always pull in a direction opposite to that which your fish is traveling. In order to accomplish this, this will inevitably require changes of the angle at which you hold the rod. When you do, keep rod movement smooth and fluid. Listen carefully to your guide as he talks you through the battle. Nobody wants your fish to be released in good condition more than your guide does. The survival of released tarpon or bonefish decreases severely when predators like sharks are abundant. These predators often attack a tarpon or bonefish soon after it is released. When predators become abundant and appear to be attracted to your fishing activity, consider moving to another fishing location. If a shark appears while you're fighting a tarpon, break the tarpon off so it has a chance to escape the shark before it's too tired. And finally, it's critically important to reduce the fight and handling time in warmer water. Hi, I'm Aaron Adams. I'm the Director of Science and Conservation for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Today we're going to talk about bonefish connectivity, or are our fish their fish? There are two ways that different populations of fish can be connected, by migration of adults or by the oceanic transport of larvae. Tarpon are a good example of how adult migrations connect populations. The fish that you catch in the Keys might be the same fish someone else catches in South Carolina, but for bonefish, it's a different story. For bonefish, we know that they have small home ranges, but tagging in the Bahamas has shown us that they'll migrate long distances to go to spawning locations, which are located offshore. When they spawn, the larvae that hatch in the open water float around for between 40 and 70 days. During that time, those larvae could circle back and end up right where the parents started from, or they could be transported long distances by the ocean current. That means that the bonefish in the Keys might not have been born in the Keys. They might have been spawned in southwest Cuba, Mexico, or Belize, and then ended up in the Keys as babies. So even if you fish for bonefish in the Florida Keys, you have to realize that a decent number of the fish you're catching could have parents from Mexico, Belize, or Cuba. That means that you have to not only be concerned about habitat conservation in the Keys and water quality improvements, you also have to be concerned about those same issues in those other locations, as well as how those fisheries are regulated so that there's not high harvest of fish that are trying to spawn. We really have to think about our fish are really their fish, and we have to manage them as a collective group. My name is Dr. Andy Danilchuk, and I'm an associate professor of fish conservation at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and I'm also a BTT research fellow. There are two ways in which fish populations in different locations can be connected, either through the migration of their juveniles and adults, or through the transport of their larvae in the ocean currents after they spawn. A way that we track the movement patterns of tarpon is through this cool technology, acoustic telemetry. Acoustic telemetry uses these really neat uh, receivers that we put around the ocean, uh, we, we moor them on the ocean floor and they have a battery and they have some memory and they also have this little transducer and when a tarpon that's tagged with an acoustic transmitter um, swims by, this receiver records the data, stores it, and then periodically we download these receivers and, and then analyze the data. There are over 4,000 of these receivers out there that are, are helping us understand the movement patterns of Atlantic tarpon. The transmitters, what's neat about them is that they're relatively small. These little things here, um, we surgically implant them into the tarpon. Uh, they recover very well and because they're so small, we can put them in tarpon that are about 10 pounds and, and, and up. So we can put them also in the beasts too. With these transmitters, they have a five-year battery life so we can actually track the same individual from season to season to see if there's consistency from one year to the next 
or maybe there's a diversity in the movement patterns for the same individual. We're actually seeing some really, really amazing results um, that are critical for how we really take care of the Silver King, not only for us to continue to enjoy, but also for future generations of anglers. Hi, my name's Justin Lewis, and I'm the Bahamas Initiative Manager for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Bonefish and Tarpon Trust was started over 20 years ago by a group of concerned anglers that noticed a significant decline in bonefish in the Keys. Since that time, we've learned a great deal more about bonefish, especially about their life cycles and factors that have led to their decline elsewhere. So one of the fascinating things Bonefish Tarpon Trust and our collaborators have started to figure out is the connectivity of bonefish populations between Florida, the Bahamas, and the wider Caribbean. So rather than being individual fisheries in each region, it's more of one big connected fishery. All the research that BTT has done over the years has also helped us figure out what the economic impact of the bonefish fishery is to Florida, to the Bahamas, Belize, Mexico, and the wider Caribbean. It's also helped us advocate for protecting vital bonefish habitat. For example, in the Bahamas, we recently helped get six new national parks put in place purely for the protection of bonefish in their habitats. BTT's tag recapture program in the Bahamas has found that bonefish have really small home ranges. We also know they'll travel long distances to spawn. When they travel long distances to spawn, they're heading to these places called pre-spawning aggregation sites. These are areas that are deeper protected bays that have easy access to the open ocean drop off and also easy access to the flats. When the fish congregate in these bays at dusk, they become really active. They'll start porpoising and gulping air. Once the sun sets, they're gonna head offshore en masse into thousands of feet of water, but they'll spawn in the, in the top 200 feet of the water column. And they spawn by a process called broadcast spawning. That's where multiple females will break off from the school followed by um, several males. Once spawning occurs, the adults head back to their home range and the fertilized eggs are left to the current. Within a day or two, the eggs hatch into larval bonefish that we call leptocephalus. They're clear, eel-like looking larvae. They're gonna be out offshore mixed in with other plankton for an average of 52 days. After the 52 days, they're gonna move inshore into shallow backwater bays where they'll actually metamorphose from that clear eel-like larvae into a juvenile bonefish. My name is Aaron Adams. I'm the Director of Science and Conservation for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Today we're going to talk about the life cycle of permit. BTT has been instrumental in gaining information about the permit life cycle. For example, we were the first to document that juvenile permit required open sandy beaches like we find along both coasts of Florida. In addition to learning about juvenile permit, BTT's research was also instrumental in creating the special permit zone, which encompasses Biscayne Bay, Florida Bay, and the Florida Keys. In the special permit zone, there are stricter regulations on permit harvest, including protection of spawning permit during the spawning season. Research has shown that permits spawn on deep drop-offs on offshore reefs, as well as offshore artificial reefs. They do this in the summer in the Florida Keys from April through July, but down in Belize, they spawn most of the year from February through October. Importantly, the fish that we catch on the flats migrate to those offshore spots to spawn and then back to the reefs. When permits spawn offshore, they do what's called broadcast spawning. In large groups, they get together, eject eggs and sperm out into the open water, and then the fertilized eggs and then the larvae when they hatch after about a day float in the open ocean for about 20 days. That means the juvenile permit that come into beaches in Florida could come from local spawning or they could come from distant spawning, like Mexico, Belize, or even Cuba. So to make sure that we have permit to pursue in the future, we have to think about habitat conservation, water quality improvements, not just where we fish, say, in Florida, but throughout the Caribbean because they're all connected. And then we also, as anglers, have to think about proper catch and release to make sure those fish survive. That means we have to be concerned about local conservation of our habitats, but also about other people in other locations protecting their permit fisheries and habitats as well. My name is Joellen Wilson. I'm the Juvenile Tarpon Habitat Program Manager for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. 
Through Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, Tarpon Genetic Research, we realized that Atlantic tarpon are one large population that are all genetically similar. When it comes to managing a species that's so wide geographically, it's really important that we manage at the local level, the state level, and the federal level. From what we know about tarpon spawning, we know that they spawn offshore because they go to deep depths, and this is pretty common through other fishes. Tarpon spawn in the summers in Florida, about May through July during the full and new moons. But in other places, especially once they get more north in the northern Gulf and then also up through South Carolina, they're probably spawning much later in the summer. Tarpon broadcast spawn, which means they basically release their genetic material out into the water, um, and that's where the eggs fertilize and hatch. Once the eggs fertilize and hatch, they start the larval period and they look like a pretty small, clear worm. And especially in the Gulf, you know, they're 80 to 100 miles offshore. If larvae are lucky enough to survive and make it to these inshore coastal waters, then they start searching out these calm back bay areas before they can metamorphose into the juveniles. These backwater areas are typically low in dissolved oxygen, which acts as somewhat of a refuge for tarpon. Tarpon, especially juvenile tarpon, but also all tarpon, have the ability to come to the surface and take oxygen from the air, so they don't need it in the water. These low oxygen backwater habitats exclude other big fish like redfish, jacks, and ladyfish from being able to, to eat the juvenile tarpon. As the juvenile tarpon grow in these habitats, they eventually migrate and they immigrate out of these habitats and move on to the next phase, which we call the subadult tarpon. The farther inland that we find these nursery habitats, these sanctuaries for the juvenile tarpon, the closer that they are to humans, the more likely they're impacted by nutrient runoff, contaminants, and mostly development. This is why Bonefish and Tarpon Trust has made identification, protection, and also restoration of juvenile nursery habitats so important. Once a juvenile nursery habitat is lost, it reduces the overall size for future populations. So less habitat means fewer fish for our children and our children's children. I'm Aaron Adams. I'm the Director of Science and Conservation for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Today we're going to talk about Everglades water issues. The recreational fishery in the Florida Everglades region has an annual economic impact that exceeds a billion dollars a year. In addition, the water coming out of the Florida Everglades impacts the fisheries on the southwest coast of Florida, southeast coast, and even into the Florida Keys. A lot of people don't know this, but the watershed for the Florida Everglades starts up near Orlando. Historically, the fresh water coming through the Everglades flows south through Lake Okeechobee and into the Florida Everglades, with very little of it reaching southwest Florida and none of it reaching southeast Florida. Decades ago, South Florida's water flows were altered to benefit development and agriculture. Lake Okeechobee became a reservoir. It was connected to the Caloosahatchee River and the St. Lucie River, which are now used as canals to drain Lake Okeechobee. Very little fresh water goes from Lake Okeechobee into Florida Bay anymore through the Everglades. This has made Florida Bay far too salty, which a few years ago resulted in 50,000 acres of seagrass dying. This had obvious negative consequences on the fishery. At the same time, when Lake Okeechobee has too much fresh water, it pumps that water out through the Clusahatchee River and through the St. Lucie River in the billions of gallons a day. This has killed those estuaries with too much fresh water, killing all the seagrass, the oysters, the clams, and a lot of the fish that game fish prey upon. In addition to changing the patterns of freshwater flow in South Florida, that flow coming out of Lake Okeechobee is now highly polluted. It's got so many nutrients that it causes algae blooms. A lot of these algae blooms are toxic. The Caloosahatchee River and the St. Lucie River have both had toxic cyanobacteria or blue-green algae blooms. These not only kill fish and what they feed on, they're also toxic to humans and cause both short-term and long-term health problems. The extra nutrients coming out of the Caloosahatchee River and other sources are also probably enhancing the frequency, duration, intensity, and spread of red tide in southwest Florida, and has now recently happened even in the east coast of Florida. Our science has told us how we've messed up our estuaries and coasts and the fisheries that depend upon healthy habitats and clean water. And the science can lead us to fixing those problems. So now it's up to you to flex your muscle as anglers and guides to make sure that those policy changes happen so we have healthy habitats in the future.
My name is Joellen Wilson. I'm the Juvenile Tarpon Habitat Program Manager for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, and I'll be discussing juvenile tarpon and snook nursery habitat. Juvenile tarpon and snook both depend on mangrove wetlands and salt marshes and other backwater ponds and creeks that are difficult to reach, mostly for predators, but it's also places where we're not usually fishing. Prime nursery habitat includes mangrove roots or other types of vegetative structure that serve as a refuge and protection from predators such as larger fish or birds. These habitats also have deep pools that can be used as a temperature refuge. As juvenile tarpon and snook grow, they make their way out of the nursery habitat into larger bays and into estuaries. But these nursery habitats are especially vulnerable to development. With 50% of Florida's population living near the coast, land is being developed constantly. Mangrove forests are one of the most threatened coastal habitats in the world. Florida alone has lost 50% of its mangrove habitat and 9.3 million acres of wetlands, more than any other state in the nation. Identifying these nursery habitats for protection and also potentially restoration is crucial to the future of the fishery for snook and tarpon. We all have a responsibility to be good stewards of the environment and to help save our piece of the planet. For flats anglers, wow, look at our piece of the planet. We have an opportunity here to save what we love. An incredible resource, a place, an intersection where water and land meet and harbor the habitats of our fishery. A fishery that calls to us, pulls us at all times, inspires and excites us, maybe even haunts us at night. So for a place that has that kind of meaning in our lives, we have to respond and hear the call to conserve it. Do that, be an ethical angler, stay informed and engaged in everything that benefits the fishery, and join Bonefish and Tarpon Trust.